Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Very glad you're with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Happy Fiscal New Year, Jim. I know you're excited about that. And uh, we also have a very quick mention here at the top of the show. I think it's only appropriate. Happy 100th birthday to former President Jimmy Carter. And Jim, there's certainly a lot of the Carter record you could dissect. There are some good spots. There's a whole lot from our perspective as conservatives, bad spots in that record. But on a day like this, we figure, you know, it's a significant milestone that can wait. But for a guy whose greatest accomplishment might be spending over a year and a half now as a hospice patient, I I think the fact that he just will never die, I think, is uh, the most significant accomplishment uh, so far. He just keeps going. And on this milestone, good for him. Listeners, rest assured that the legacy of Jimmy Carter will be discussed and dissected on this podcast, likely by the children of Greg and myself, considering how much he's how he's hanging on there. Uh, Somewhere in 2047, uh, it'll be it'll be Greg, you know, one little Columbus and one little Garrity uh, talking over the, the Jimmy Carter legacy. That's exactly right. I did hear one interesting nugget today, so I can't take credit for this. It's from a local uh, radio host named Chris Plant, who pointed out today that Jimmy Carter's birth date, October 1st, 1924, closer to the day that Jefferson and Adams died than today. So that tells you <laughs> how, how short the history of our country really is in, in the grand scheme of things. But uh, Nonetheless, Jimmy Carter, you have reached a milestone no other president has. When we were little kids, John Adams was the longest ever, then Reagan, then Ford, then Bush Sr., and Jimmy Carter's had it for a while now, and easily the first one to 100. But anyway, let's get to our good martini. In terms of uh, what we're learning about how the Israeli intelligence operation works, (laughs) is just truly amazing. So the source for this story is... Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran. So, But CNN over in Turkey is reporting this and, and other things that basically Mossad had infiltrated Iran so well that, this is, this is the quote, Iran's secret service had established a unit to target Mossad agents within Iran. However, the head of this unit turned out to be a Mossad operative himself along with 20 other agents. So... Mr. Ayatollah, we're going to get right on this. We've got our best men on it. I don't know why we can't find any. I don't know why your guys keep getting killed, but we'll keep working on it. Looking back over the history of intelligence coups and counterintelligence, some of the biggest and most damaging spies in U.S. history worked in counterintelligence. Aldrich Ames and uh, was Strauss the one over at the FBI? Hanson, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Hanson, yeah. When the guy in charge of finding the other enemy, the enemy spies, is an enemy spy, you generally make very slow progress. Uh, at best, a yes. lot of false accusations, a lot of false leads, a lot of you know time wasted. And if indeed the Israelis uh, managed to do this in this case, kudos! Yet another amazing uh, Mossad triumph. Uh, also, this just handed to me. Just I'm going to free advice to the Iranians. Half of your ranks are Mossad. But we're not saying which half. So good luck. Um, <laughs> the I'm waiting for everybody to pull their guns on each other, like uh, uh, Shield and and Hydra in in the Captain America movie. First of all, it is really fascinating that after October seventh, when Israel seems so utterly blindsided and unprepared for the terrorist attack by Hamas, that they've pulled off such a stunning success against Hezbollah and now a stunning success against the Iranian government. This would be an, an unvarnished good martini if, as we were preparing to record the, the uh, podcast today, there wasn't news that the U.S. has informed Israel that there is a risk of a Iranian ballistic missile attack on Israel sometime in the next 12 hours. Maybe by the time people listen to this today, the, we'll, we'll know one way or the other whether that's going to happen. Uh, I should emphasize, ballistic missiles not mean a nuke necessarily, uh, but nonetheless, ballistic missiles can do a heck of a lot of damage. Ballistic simply means a trajectory going up and then down. It would be a giant provocation, a giant step in a more aggressive direction for Iran. We'll see if anything happens from this. So stay tuned, unless you're in Israel, at which point my understanding, you you know, this U.S. embassy employees have been told to shelter in place. I imagine everybody else in Israel is doing something similar. 
Good luck to everybody over there. Hopefully we have another good martini tomorrow saying nothing actually happened. You know, I, I can understand to some extent why the Iranians feel like they want to attack. Uh, obviously, they were bankrolling Hezbollah and they're mad about how Hezbollah has been decimated, at least in the leadership ranks. Then the Houthis were sending missiles towards Israel and then the Israelis responded by destroying their entire power infrastructure and it looks like their oil infrastructure as well. So the Iranians are getting more and more frustrated. But if you go back to the first half of this martini, you might want to be careful about what you do because you have no idea what's happening right mm. next to you <laughs> in Iran. So the reprisal might be uh, significant. My colleagues had said that uh, after the incident with the pagers and the beepers, um, who wants to press the button in Iran? <laughs> Ayatollah, you make the you, you press that button. I'm just going to back up over here. You can do it. Uh, I'm just going to get behind this concrete wall. Good luck. Get, go get them. Everybody's looking over their shoulder. They're probably bumping into each other over there. They're looking over their shoulder so much. But uh, yeah, tense times, tense times to be sure. So definitely something to keep an eye on. All right, Jim, for our bad martini, we come much closer to home, and there is a major union strike happening all along the Atlantic coast today, as well as the Gulf Coast. So basically, all of America, except for the Pacific Coast, Alaska, and Hawaii, the International Longshoremen Association has gone on strike. There have not been any significant negotiations happening since June, and the longshoremen want a 77% wage hike. The uh, management is offering the paltry gym 50% wage hike mm. over six years, plus much better pensions, plus much better benefits. But no, no, the longshoremen are saying we're not going to accept that. You've got to meet our deal. And, and the guy that's the spokesman, the president, the lead negotiator for the International Longshoremen's Association is this guy named Harold Daggett who's right out of central casting for a union boss, I got to say, and you'll hear it in his voice here. Uh, so first of all, he says that uh, they need this massive uh, raise because they stayed on the job, on the docks during COVID. Well, I want to be compensated for that. I'm not asking for the world. They know what I want. They know what I want. And if they don't, well, then I have to go into the street and we have to fight for what we rightfully deserve. I assume they were paid during COVID, but nonetheless, yeah, uh, yeah. this is now his threat as to what will happen the longer this strike goes on. You know what's going to happen? I'll tell you. First week, be all over the news every night, boom, boom. Second week, guys who sell cars can't sell cars because the cars ain't coming in off the ships. They get laid off. Third week, malls start closing down. They can't get the goods from China. They can't sell clothes. They can't do this. Everything in the United States comes on a ship. They go out of business. Construction workers get laid off because the materials aren't coming in. The steel's not coming in. The lumber's not coming in. They lose their job. Everybody's hating the longshoremen now because now they realize how important our jobs are. It'd be a shame if something happened to your economy over there, but here's his most uh, brutish language. Who's going to win here in the long run? You're better off sitting down and let's get a contract and let's move on with this world. And in today's world, I'll cripple you. I will cripple you. Seems like a nice fellow, Jim. I'm sure he'd be fine if you kept your his hedge trimmers an extra day or two uh, if you borrowed them. Um, what do you make of uh, this bullying tactic when it seems like they're getting a pretty good offer and they want nothing to do with it? Well, first of all, Greg, I just want to point out, I, I don't want to say this guy sounds sinister, but I understand that our old friend Robert Davi has been offered to play him in the movie. And and Davi <laughs> is known for uh, playing the, the menacing, villainous, tough guys there. Second of all, I love, I look, there are, there are a lot of inspiring leaders. And for him to um, quote Dr. Doom from Marvel Comics that directly, I will cripple you. Um, that's that's really inspiring right there. It might have been Bane from DC Comics, one or the other, uh, with the direct threats to cripple the country if he has, doesn't get his demands met. Look, I wrote about this in the second half of today's Morning Jolt, and th there are a couple things that are infuriating about this. One, the fact that the two sides haven't met in person since June seems a, a ludicrous state of affairs. The fact that they want a 77 pay hike over six years. Does anybody else think they're getting a 77% pay hike over six years? No, I didn't think so. I know we're all struggling with Biden inflation, but this is this is a, a ridiculous demand. You know, the, the economic consequences are going to be bad, are going to be really bad. You know, National Association of Manufacturers, if you want to say they're always on management side, fine. 
But in the end, they say this is going to cost, you know, $5 billion a day to the U.S. gross domestic product. Let's say it's not that. Let's say they're exaggerating. Let's say it's half that. Two and a half billion a day on the U.S. gross domestic product. It's still very bad, right? That's, you know, uh, and they said, look, you know, each uh, was Maersk shipping company said every week it's going to take, if this goes on for a week, it'll take five to six weeks to straighten this out because of the supply backlogs and moving the stuff around and all that stuff. So it's it's going to be bad. Now, I just want to point out, oh, let's also point out that like, you know, a whole bunch of these ports are in the Southeast. Um, anything happen in the Southeast that might make this a really bad time to have a big national strike? Oh, that's right, the hurricane. All those people who are desperately needing aid. This is not the time to have a giant supply chain stoppage uh, when people need emergency replies and they're going to need to rebuild houses and wood and new vehicles and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then finally, look, under Taft-Hartley, President Biden can say to the talk workers, you know what, because of the national economy and the importance of the country, you, can, you have to go back to work. Negotiations must continue. And he can pressure both sides to get to a middle one. Biden has explicitly said he will not do this because, quote, because there's collective bargaining, I don't believe in Taft-Hartley. So I just want to think of all the times Biden has gone beyond his extent, the constitutional powers. Think of all the times the Supreme Court has said on student loans and COVID mandates and stuff like that. No, you don't have the authority to do this. Here is something that the president explicitly has in the law, passed constitutional tests, and Biden says, I'm not going to, because I don't believe in it. It's not Santa Claus. It's not whether you believe it or not. You have this power. And you have the power to mitigate an enormous amount of economic damage. Oh, by the way, a month before the election, do you think the Kamala Harris campaign is rooting for far-reaching economic disruptions and supplies and food not being on the shelves? No, I don't think so. Which is one of the reasons like, I've seen economic, economic analysts saying this strike won't go on that long because Biden will force them to go back to work. And that could happen. It could, you know, at some point, the Harris campaign might call up Biden and say, we need you to you know, get them back to work pronto. But as of now, he's saying he's not. And I don't know how this is going to shake out. Anyway, any way you look at it, a very bad martini. All right, Jim, on to our crazy martini now, or what could be a crazy martini. We're basically previewing the vice presidential debate tonight. CBS is hosting, obviously, J.D. Vance versus Tim Walls. We'll see how it goes. We'll see what questions come up. CBS has said they're not going to do the ABC tactic of trying to do the instant fact checking. And of course, every left leaning uh, analyst is now saying, well, that's just journalistic dereliction here. No, it's the candidate's job to correct the other candidate. That's what the debates are all about. Your job is to tee up the issues and they take it from there. So J.D. Vance seems to have his uh, command of more details uh, than Donald Trump. I've heard differing reports about whether he's preparing significantly for this or not uh, preparing much at all. Uh, on the on the Democratic side, Pete Buttigieg, who should be involved in trying to resolve the Longshoreman strike, I think, is uh, playing the, the role of J.D. Vance in the debate for Tim Walls. The Democrats, smartly, have downplayed Walls as a debater, saying that he even told Kamala Harris before she picked him that he's not a good debater. So they're setting, or at least trying to set, expectations low. Republicans uh, uh, have not been great at that lately. What do you expect tonight? What do you think the strategies will be? And it's the vice presidential debate, so will it matter at all? Yeah, the the headline in today's morning jolt about pulse-pounding, white-knuckle, edge-of-your-seat action in the vice presidential debate is indeed sarcastic. Uh, I don't expect... I mean, like, I also didn't think that the first Trump and Biden debate was going to be a huge game-changer and all it replaced was the nominee. So, yes, it's conceivable that this does turn out to be a bigger deal. Look, at this point, this looks like it's going to be the last debate of the cycle. It's very weird to finish on the vice presidential debate. That's not the way it usually works. Trump sounds like he does not want to do another debate. And so this could be the last word, at least in terms of nationally televised debates. This is, as you mentioned, everybody's in expectations setting. And this is where like I, that whole report on CNN that Walls is nervous, I, that all sounds like uh, smoke and misdirection and, and all that stuff. This is where each side is supposed to lower expectations for their candidate. But J.D. Vance should do well tonight. They, and if he doesn't, I think people would be really disappointed. If there's nothing else, he's a very attack, effective attack dog. I thought, as much as I didn't like the content of it, he was a great gave a great convention speech. He can be amiable and personable when he wants to be, but he also can be a really tough uh, critic of the other side. And Tim Walls does not seem like 
Cicero. This this is not some, you know, phenomenal debater who, who should be, you know, really tough to take on. So I don't want to be in the business of like wildly raising expectations, but there's a little bit of a sense of if J.D. Vance doesn't go out there and at minimum have a solid night, ideally, you know, mop the floor with them. If he doesn't do that, it's kind of, J.D. Vance, what are you doing on the on this ticket? This, this is supposed to be your, your strong. This is where your A game is. This is the strength of what you do. So we'll see how that shakes out. I don't think it'll dramatically change the dynamics of the race. Although I think one of the, re- I wonder if one of the reasons the Harris campaign wanted another presidential debate was nervousness of having Tim Walls be the last word and, and having this last moment uh, to close the, close the sale uh, for Kamala Harris. Also, by the way, you notice, I mean, looking at all seven key swing states are still within the margin of error. The idea that Walls was going to lock up the, the blue wall states hasn't really happened, has it? Not, you know, um, oh, by the way, I looked and I mentioned in today's morning, Joel, apparently Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, is literally more popular than Taylor Swift in his home state. So uh, if Kamala Harris does not win the state of Pennsylvania in this election, which you got to figure right now looks like a 50-50 shot. And if she doesn't win the presidency, and it's much tougher to win the presidency as a Democrat if you don't win Pennsylvania, then this is the equivalent of picking Sam Bowie over Michael Jordan back in the 1984 <laughs> NBA draft. Like, like Shapiro was there. You, you could have picked him. It probably would have locked up the Keystone State. But no, no, you had to have Tim. You had to go with flannel guy. No, he's, you know, he's folksy. Talks about carburetors. He'll be fine. Well, doesn't feel fine now. He waves very vigorously. He's got a lot of vigor. Anyway, we'll see how much uh, J.D. Vance focuses on Tim Walls and his record in Minnesota, his murky connections to China, or do you spend most of your time punching at the presidential nominee because that's the the person that the voters are going to care about more than the VP nominee. It's, it's a balance, but uh, I think you got to do both, but you probably punch more at the at the presidential nominee, right? Yeah, oh, exactly. That, that, you know, in the end, this is making the argument against the Harris administration. One of the points I kind of laid out in today's morning jolt was the recognition that, like, if Trump and Vance are elected, we know what Vance's role is going to be. Vance is the detail guy. Trump is the big picture. He, he you know, it'd be a similar dynamic, ironically, with, you know, with Mike Pence. Trump does not want to get bogged down in the details of policy. This is where Vance specializes. He's much more, this is much more his, he's much more of a wonk, shall we say. If Harris gets elected, what does she have Tim Walls do? What policy would she want to entrust him with? China? You know, I, I, the Chinese would like that, I'm sure. But yeah, um, I'm sure they would. <laughs> uh, you know, like education. Uh, the, I, but what is the Harris uh, agenda on education? This is one of the reasons when you run as a blank slate, there are some serious we- you know weaknesses with that. And I just kind of figure Tim Walls is there. To, to be folksy. I, I don't know if there's there's no department of folksiness you'd want him to over to overlook. There's no, you know, like, and everyone's like, oh, is that true for all the vice presidents? Now, you know darn well what Al Gore was doing in Bill Clinton's presidency. You knew darn well what Dick Cheney was doing in uh, the Bush administration. The, the, yes, the vice presidential's role is not really clearly defined in the Constitution, but you figure there'd be some areas of policy that he'd be taking the lead on. I think it's extremely likely that Harris, as president, would tell Tim Walls, congratulations, you're the new migration czar. <laughs> no, I think they, 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 they put him on the ticket because they did think Josh Shapiro could be a problem in Michigan uh, and because they thought that Tim Walls would be a sign to white men that it's okay to vote for Democrats. Mm-hmm. Hasn't really turned out that way. All right, Jim, take good notes. We'll talk about it a lot tomorrow. See you then. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Do subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Tell your friends about us as well. Thanks for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us both on X. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a terrific Tuesday and join us again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.